Hello everyone, Gustavo here. Today I want to answer with this video a very common question that several students email me and they ask. It doesn't matter if it is undergraduate students at the university where I teach or even the online courses that I teach. The students, they email me and they say, Gustavo, why are you asking me to install this library called SDL if we are going to use C or C++ in the course? Why do I have to go and install SDL? Why is SDL good for? Right? And the answer to this question, to understand why we have to use this library, I want to go back a little bit to 1994, 1995, 1996, whenever I was starting to get my hands dirty and my feet wet with programming. Back in the day, let's say that I started working with a C project and I had a machine, right? Way back in the day, it was very easy for me to go and instruct and gain access to certain hardware elements of my machine. So if I wanted to go in my machine and I wanted to, let's say, instruct that I wanted to paint a certain pixel of the display with a certain color, right? Let's say if I want to go and paint that pixel red. Way back in the day, right, in the 90s, 1890s, uh, we had these ideas of memory mapping. So there was a specific place in memory, certain addresses in memory, that I could just go there in a certain address, and I would just put a value, a number there, and that number represented the color red. And then as soon as I went there and I populated that memory address with that color number, the display driver knew already that everything that was populated in that specific memory address had to come here and it goes and it knows how to display that color using the CRT display, right? using the tube display. And if I went to another memory position that was a specific hard-coded address and I put a different value there, right? If I just went there and I populated with a different value, then it knew how to go and populate and light the little pixel with a different color based on the number that I added to that memory position. But that was back in the day where everything was a lot simpler. I had direct access to memory. I could just go with my C++ or my C code. I could just go access that memory position, add a little value to that memory address, and then the display driver, the hardware, knew already how to go and paint the correct pixels for me. And not only the display driver, I could go and I could poke and fetch values from the keyboard, I could go and uh, fetch values from the mouse coordinate cursor position. So everything that had to do with hardware, right? Accessing the hardware of the machine, I could do that directly, uh, just going and poking values, going and fetching values directly from memory, right? Everything was memory mapped. The device driver, everything was mapped to certain memory positions. But then we evolved, right? And now we can no I cannot go right now as a programmer. If I am running a, a modern machine using a modern operating system, I don't have direct access to this hardware elements, right? Uh, there is this wall that is protecting me from going and uh, putting some dirt value in memory and accessing the entire memory and everything that I want. And that wall is, of course, the operating system that we are running, right? So if you are a Windows user, if you are a Linux user, a FreeBSD user, doesn't matter, right? Modern operating systems, they are this protection, right? They are protecting the hardware. Uh, users and programmers, you cannot just go and crazily type and populate things as you want because that is a violation, right, of security of the hardware. I only have access to the little memory space that the operating system gives to my program that I'm running, right? So if you go there and you compile your program with GCC, let's say, that program, when you compile and you run, you ask Linux to run that program, or you ask Windows to run that program, or Mac OS, or anything, the operating system will give you a little space in memory that you have access to, right? That you can go and populate, use your variables, add the data. And of course, as you are running, you can ask, for example, malloc to go and allocate on the heap more and more and more. But the operating system is responsible for knowing what can be given to you as a programmer. You cannot just go crazy and start poking the memory addresses of the display driver or asking and fetching values from the keyboard. For that, you have this wall, and if you want to go and display things on the display, and if you want to go and get things from the keyboard, you need to ask the operating system to do that. 
right? You need to ask the Windows API for the correct Windows functions to then go and give access to the display values. You need to ask the Linux X server to go and ask the Linux correct functions and C function APIs to go and give access to the display, keyboard, mouse, audio, and all those things, right? Everything that has to do with hardware, drivers, uh, access to these hardware elements and hardware subcomponents is done via the operating system API. But think about my, <laughs> my situation right now. So if I'm teaching students to create a game engine, or if I'm teaching students to create a 3D render or anything, I don't want to go and have a complete course only targeting Windows students. And then if I have students that use Linux, I don't have to create an entire course that takes five hours and explain how to go and display things only using the Linux API and functions and etc. And if my users are using macOS, I don't want to spend extra four hours teaching how the macOS does things and all the nuances that the macOS expects us to pass for the function, etc. That would be a complete pain. That is why I want my courses always to be multi-platform. My goal is, as a professor, I want you to, regardless of the operating system that you have, I want us to write one C++ code, one C code, and that code should run in every machine. If you're using Windows, Intel processor, ARM processors, Raspberry Pi, Linux, FreeBSD, NetBSD, I don't care what is the operating system, we should go and write one code in C++, right? We want to learn how to program using C or C++. That code should run in any platform. That is why we need to use this helper library. And that helper library is SDL, right? SDL works as this bridge between our core C or C++ code and the operating system calls and the operating system ways of accessing the hardware elements that we want. So all these hardware elements that we need, the display, the keyboard, the mouse, the audio, uh, accessing different file system elements, we can use that, we can use SDL. We only need to say SDL, display window, SDL, create window, SDL, paint pixel with a certain color. We only use the SDL functions and SDL, the SDL library is super smart and knows how to translate to the correct operating system calls that you are running on top of, right? This is why. I just wanted to pause and explain because not only teaching you how to install SDL and get things running, I need to give you the philosophical reason, right? Why are we using SDL in the first place? Can we do everything with C++? No, we cannot. Well, you could have C++ and have the direct operating system API call. So if you want to open a window and display a pixel only using the Windows operating system, then you ask the Windows operating system for the correct function. But if you want to be multi-platform, then I would recommend using a library like SDL. And look, don't get me wrong, SDL is not the only one. It might not even be the best one of these libraries. You have libraries like SFML, you have libraries like Allegro, you have libraries that are similar to SDL. My choice is usually to go with SDL. SDL has been proven, the industry has been testing and stressing SDL enough. So there are several games, several applications that use SDL in the wild, right? They are, it's proven to work and uh, the ratio of bugs is fairly small. So SDL is a good library I like using. SDL is a C library and it's core, but you can use with C++ no issues, right? There is, it is a fairly transparent effort to just go and use it with C++ as well. So if you are using Linux, right, if you want to go and install a Linux dependency to run SDL, all you have to do is open your terminal. And if you are using a package manager, which usually any Linux distribution uses, right? So let's say that you're using a Debian based distro. What you have to do is just basically go to the terminal and say sudo apt install build essential 
to make sure that you have the compiler, right? The C++ compiler, the C compiler of the GNU family of uh, tools. So build ascension makes sure that you have the compilers and everything, right? The linker, everything that you need to compile C and C++ code. And then the second line, sudo apt install libsdl2-dev. We want to make sure that we are installing the SDL2 version, right? So that is all you have to do. You just type that thing, hit enter, just press yes, yes to confirm. It takes a little bit of time. What we'll do is the package manager will go connect to a repository online and start downloading all the SDL dependency files and already installing all those files and placing those files in the correct folders of the Linux operating system. So all you have to do in whenever you are programming with C or C++, all you have to do is include sdl2 forward slash sdl.h. That is all you have to do to go and include that header file. As soon as you do that, you should be ready to go and start calling the sdl functions, creating an sdl window using the Linux machine. Everything should be transparent only using sdl functions. So we are going to use the sdl functions to create an operating system window to go and paint that window at a certain color, draw some objects in that window, everything using the SDL library, right? We are basically bypassing and trusting SDL to translate to the correct operating system calls that is doing under the hood. And that's it. This is how you go and install Linux SDL, right? It's as simple as using a package manager Painless, not much going on there. Of course, if you're using Red Hat, if you're using Arc Linux, any other distro, then the package manager might be different. You might be using Yum, you might be using Pac-Man, right? So different package managers, but it is effortless anyway. All right, that is Linux. If you're using Mac OS, it should be as easy as, again, using a package manager as well. So I would install a package manager called Brew. And then you open your terminal, right? It is, uh, since macOS is basically a Unix-like operating system, you open your terminal and I would just say, brew install SDL2. Hit enter, confirm, confirm, next, next, finish. That's it. Same thing, brew will go, will connect to a repository online, download all the files and already populate the correct folders globally in the operating system. So all you have to do in your source code is include SDL2 forward slash sdl.h. That is all you have to do to start using SDL after you ask to install using Brew. So do you see Linux and macOS, they have these old ideas of package manager using the terminal, it's painless, it does everything already for you, it's very uh, good when it comes to programmer uh, user experience, right? It's effortless for us. The problem starts whenever you are using Microsoft specific operating system, right? As we all know as programmers, Microsoft is always a little bit more difficult to configure things. So if you want to install SDL on Windows, we are pretty much constricted to what Microsoft dictates that you should use, right? So since Windows doesn't have a very good terminal, right, that is not as powerful still as the Linux or Mac OS terminal, what I would suggest is I think we are pretty much stuck with the way that Microsoft wants us to work, right? So I would we will have to use an ID, right? So we're going to have to use Visual Studio. I think that will probably be the best option on Windows. This is what I'm going to do. To install SDL on Windows is not a super fast task, but I already have a video that I explain where that is. So all you have to do is make sure that you go to this link that I'm putting right there. That is the link for my video where I go and I open a Windows machine and I just teach you how to go and configure all the little pieces of the puzzle that is Visual Studio, access the linker, access the compiler. There's a lot of things that you have to configure to make sure that SDL works correctly on a Visual Studio machine, okay? But my point was, this course is not, is not a tutorial on how to do anything. It was basically just an answer to the question that is very common. Gustavo, why do we have to install SDL? Or why do we have to install SFML? Or why do we have to install Allegro or any of these libraries to access hardware? That was why, right? Because we are going to access 
display elements, I want to paint the display, I want to create a window, I want to render things on the monitor, I want to fetch values from the keyboard, I want to access the coordinates to the positions of the mouse, if the mouse is being clicked or not, I want to access the idea of if I want to emit any sound using the sound elements of the operating system. All these hardware specific things, they are accessed via the operating system. But since we don't want to be operating system specific in our C or C++ code, then we use SDL, right? SDL is always going to be this bridge, this helper tool that is going to translate things and be this multi-platform output, right? We want our program to be multi-platform, regardless if you're running things on Windows, if my students are running Linux, FreeBSD, Raspberry Pi as well, right? Or even mobile, Android, etc. SDL is usually a good tool. And I think it is a great thing for us as programmers. But wait, wait, before you go, remember that if you like this type of content, subscribe, thumbs up, all that jazz. And don't forget, right, that at picuma.com, where I teach, you will find complete courses on how to create a 2D game engine using C++, SDL, and scripting things using the Lua language. Right? So we create a full feature, small 2D game engine where we explore all these concepts using, of course, SDL to communicate with the hardware to get things and display things on the monitor. Right? So don't forget, if you want full feature courses on computer science, mathematics, programming, just visit picuma.com. I will be super happy to see you there. Thank you very much. See you soon.